much. So let's continue with our tithes and offerings. And so for the past couple of months, we've been going through a, a very interesting Bible study in our home group, and it's based on the book by Pastor Robert Morris from Dream to Destiny. And it basically includes 12 character building tests that Joseph had to go through in order to fulfill his destiny and his purpose. And one of those tests was the prosperity test, which is basically if we manage our finances wisely. And we go through, well, we take that test every time we get a paycheck, essentially. And God trusts us with these resources, and He trusts us that we will manage them wisely and that we will allocate them wisely. So He calls us to be faithful and to be stewards of these resources. And Proverbs 3, 9 to 10 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled with filled to overflowing, and your vats will bring over with new wine. So I just encourage you to be faithful in what the God has blessed you with, and be stewards of his resources here. So let's pray, and then we will be passing the basket. Lord, we just lift up our offerings and our finances to you, Father, and we trust you with them, Lord. And just give us wisdom how to manage them, Lord so that we multiply and that we serve you and we build your kingdom here, Lord. And we just um, proclaim that you are the Lord in all aspects of our life, including our finances, Lord. We trust you with it and we trust that you will bless us even more when we're faithful in the little that we have, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. If I say the word desire, I think all of you think of something different. And, um, but it's also something that we, if we desire something, we really put all our time, our resources in, into that, to get to that thing that we want to desire. So I think, um, what does Jesus say about desire? In uh, Matthew 16, 24, he says to his disciples, if someone desires to come after me, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. So if Jesus denied his deity to come for our salvation and if he, he went onto the cross to die to, so that we can have eternal peace and salvation then how much more can we deny our worldly things, our worldly desires we just sang here that make us, make us our vessels, make us our offering so I think that is what we have to do if we really want to desire him we have to deny our worldly things let's pray Lord, thank you that we know that you have denied your deity for us, that you have sacrificed yourself for our salvation so that we don't have any condemnation but eternal life. Help us to tap into your spirit so that we can deny our worldly desires and that we only desire you so that we can follow you in Jesus' name. Good morning, church. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we'll continue being in the presence of the Lord and um, every week we pray about whether it's going to be a country, whether it's going to be some situation in a particular country, whether it's going to be uh, an election or whatever it is. We usually practice common prayer about something. And I just thought this time we, 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 we might pray about the, the whole Europe because we are an international church and even over here there were five people from five different countries, from five different nations. Yay. Yeah, glory to God. It's amazing, isn't it? So, since we are also representing here many, many countries, um, we can pray just for the whole, um, for whole Europe. And if you if you see your flag, uh, you, you'll be able also to pray in your own language later on for your particular country. But one of the reasons why we need to pray about the Europe. It's uh, actually, like I was reading yesterday some statistics, some, some articles, some researches, and uh, based on uh, baro Eurobarometer, uh, which is representing um, Euro European Commission, they're conducting different statistics, and they uh, came uh, to a conclusion that since 2012, uh, the Christianity, it was uh, the population of Christians, it was 72%, and now it's 60 4%. So actually, one year, 1%. If it's going to be in the same tendency, it's going to be just... <laughs> you don't want to <laughs> hear the result. You, you don't want to be in that result. Amen. 
the, the whole Hebrew, the whole nation is in danger. And uh, I was reading uh, other statistics uh, from different missionaries. I want to show you a couple of slides. Can you sweep? Yeah, can you click? <coughs> yeah, because every time when we're speaking about the going on a mission trips, we usually uh, imagine ourselves like that countries, uh, Syria, Georgia, uh, India, China, or anything else. But actually, when we here in Europe, in Czech, in Czech Republic, Germany, other, other uh, uh, countries, we need uh, we need missionaries over here, yes. and based on uh, uh, what it was uh, uh, the Guardian, I guess the newspaper, they made also uh, research, and here's uh, uh, situation and graphic statistics how 16 to, to 29 year olds self identify themselves red. Red part is a non religion, non -re uh, non Christians basically. Yellow part is a Christian, and uh, the gray one is a non-Christian. So you can see the majority still, like uh, from uh, yeah, Czech Republic is on top, <laughs> as usual. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> praise Lord, it's going to be changed in Amen. Jesus' name. Amen. Estonia, Sweden, Netherlands, UK, Hungary, Belgium, France, and so on. All these countries, the ma majority of population is non-Christian. Non-Christian, yeah. And still, even those who identify themselves as a Christian, they were uh, Catholics or Orthodox. Even in my own country, I'm from Moldova, uh, or Ukraine, or Romania, they usually identify themselves as an Orthodox, which means they're going only twice per year to church, and they say, I'm a Christian. So the whole Christianity uh, basically is... Uh, just uh, uh, is, is in danger. Their salvation, the salvation of the whole nation, of the whole Europe, is in danger. Uh, another statistics, what I, uh, I found that in France, there is a one church, evangelical church, for every thirty-two thousand. In Italy, wow. one church for fifty thousand. Also, uh, uh, the other day I was also speaking with Garth, and he was sharing his experience from Italy that he he, he needed to drive one two hours to get to the church, basically. Yeah, so, uh, so we'll pray about this morning, about the salvation and awakening of Europe. More evangelical churches, more active Christians, that will be able also to represent the kingdom of God in the, in the boldness, in a fearless, uh, like a situation. Yeah, we'll pray about more intimacy with God, because the more we understand the Christianity, the more we close to God, yes. the more we can just share and be example to others, and also to testify our lives and how God works through us, in our lives. Amen. Amen. And of course, spiritual hunger and desire to see changes in our lives. Because we, we, we don't come to church only on Sundays like you do. To see each other, to have a casual conversation, to socialize, to make new friends. But hey, we actually we come to, uh, to glorify God, one of the reasons. Second, to get some additional information, the Word of God, in order to change our lives. Change our character, change our identity, and to be closer to God. So God, we thank you for Fiona. We thank you for uh, the word you put uh, on her heart. We just feel that she shall share it boldly, boldly, and to us, Lord God. We pray that you open our hearts, Lord, to receive what you have for us through her. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Glad that we have so many visitors here today. We love new visitors. They can join us today on this lovely Sunday morning. I think Ben and Gina and the worship team did a fantastic job there. Don't you guys agree? Yes. I mean, I was thoroughly impacted through the worship. And I really thank God that when we come together as a church, when we can worship together, that's when God really speaks to each and every one of us individually. And that's how we are able to be changed and transformed when we spend time in His presence. So today is what uh, John has mentioned earlier on. We are continuing the topic of uh, choices. 
Let's see. Okay, so whenever it's ready, today's topic, we are continuing along the topic sermon series called Choices. And today in particular, what I'm going to cover in on is something that is that I struggle with on a daily basis, to be honest. And it's funny because a lot of times when we find that speakers who stand up here or preachers who stand up here to talk about a certain topic, we always think that they've got it right. They've already up, they're already there. They've got it all covered. That's why they can talk to us about it. But on the contrary, I'm going to tell you that self-control is something that I struggle with on a daily basis. And I presume that I will continue to struggle with it Till the day I get to heaven, pretty much. Because it's a lifelong journey. Self-control is something that I definitely need more all the time. If you ask my husband here, my lovely husband, he'll tell you definitely she needs more self-control in life. <laughs> and I wouldn't argue with that. So what we're talking about is choosing self-control over lawlessness. Now in order to help us understand a bit better, I decided to also find a bit of a definition. So in the dictionary, it mentions that self-control, it means the ability to control oneself, in particular one's emotions and desires, especially in difficult situations. Now this is why I'm saying that it's a lifelong journey. Till the day I get to heaven, I'll still be telling God, God, as long as I'm here on earth, I need more self-control because it is difficult. It's not easy. It's essentially doing God's will and not your own if you bring it into a biblical context. I mean, if you go out to the world, we, live, we all live in a world. People who believe in God or who does not believe in God understands that it is important to have self-control in life. But when we look at the Bible, it brings it all to the next level. It's essentially not saying that you just have to have self-control in whatever that you're doing, but it's essentially doing God's will and not mine. This is why it's so challenging. Titus 2, 11 verse 12. This verse really resounds in terms of how we're going to be doing it. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no. Now the important point here, or the important verse or the word rather, it teaches us, right? It didn't say that once you get it, you get it. Teaches us, it simply means that every day we are learning something. It's a process. It's not going to be immediate. It's something on the journey. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-control, upright and godly lives in this present age. This is how relevant the Bible is. The Bible is written ages ago. I mean, it is so long time ago that I don't even know what happened back then. Life was so different. There were no computers. There was no internet. There's no Instagram, no Facebook. But yet, at the same time, God knew what he was talking about. That is why the Word of God is always relevant till the very age that we live in today. Amen. All of us throughout entire history of mankind one thing still remains the same, that each and every one of us are still humans. We have not gone to the age of bionics at this point of time. Yes, there can be some parts being replaced, some parts a bit mechanical, but ultimately what remains the same is that all of us are living beings. And this is why God is saying that, you know, self-control here, and when we learn how to say no to ungodliness, to worldly passions, and to live self-control upright and godly lives in this present age. There's a meaning for it. There's a reason for it. Why did God ask us to do that? But we'll come, that, come to why in just a bit. When I saw the topic, initially I was thinking, okay, this shouldn't be too hard. But then I was thinking about it further. This word, lawlessness. I was thinking, what, is, what does this word actually mean? How do you define lawlessness into this context, into this age? So I had to do a bit of research. In the Greek word, it's, called, it's known as anomia. An utter disregard for God and His laws. This is what it means in Greek. So this also means that a lawless person is somebody who has given himself or herself 
over completely to a sinful lifestyle. So I was thinking about this. Okay, how, how do we do this? If I'm always going to be struggling with self-control, and I know that whatever I do, it's never going to be enough to a certain extent, how do I apply this? What is essentially a difference? Is there even a difference? between somebody who practiced law, uh, lawlessness and somebody who is trying. So in the Bible, it makes a very big distinction. Number one, we all do sin. I, for one, do sin all the time, every day. And that is why I need God's grace to help me to then choose self-control. In Romans 3 verse 23, it says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So if that is the case, where does lawlessness come in? A person who practices lawlessness, it also means that they choose to continue in that lifestyle. You know, all of us have choices each day, each morning, every minute. We have a choice. You sitting here, you have a choice. You may think that you may not have a choice, but in reality, you have a choice. You have a choice to listen to what I'm saying here, or you have a choice to wander off in your mind. You have a choice to open up your heart to listen to what is being shared or to worship or you have a choice to succumb to your emotion to decide that I'm not feeling that great today I'm just gonna sit here or oh, I hope that this thing is get I'm gonna get over with go home do something else so all of us have a choice there now essentially what the Bible is saying is that yes we all do sin we all do for shock but at the same time God is also saying that I have really given you the freedom of choice. What do you want to be choosing? Do you want to practice self-control? Or do you want to continue in the lifestyle that you have got? What is your choice that you're going to be making? Now why is it so important to practice self-control? I love this verse here. <laughs> Proverbs 19 verse 3 says that people ruin their lives by their own stupidity. So why does God always get blamed? <laughs> this is why we need self-control. God is saying, like, why do you do things that is not in accordance to my will? And after that, you come to me crying, Oh God, my life is terrible. Oh God, this has happened. And I've done that plenty of times. So don't get me wrong. And then, but in hindsight, I always look at my own decisions. And I wonder, I was like, Fiona, man, that was just so stupid. Why did you do what did you, why did you do that? Why did you say that? In what areas of self-control have I regretted by making the choice that I've made? And then I went back and turned around and to ask God, God, I'm so sorry. But that doesn't mean that I did not have to live with the consequences of my choices. I still have to live with it. But at the same time, God's grace is sufficient. In what areas? of self-control. So I picked up three points that is quite common in everyday life scenario. For me, emotions. I've got to learn to practice a little bit more self-control with my emotions. My husband would be very happy with that. Especially with, when I'm upset. Especially when I'm angry. When I'm sad. Does this mean that I ignore my emotions? No. But I choose to submit then to God. I choose then to say that I need to practice self-control. I do not want to continue to stay upset because of something or someone else. So emotions is something that we all have in our daily life spaces. As long as you live in a community of people, you will have a whole range of emotions. When people make you upset, when you find that somebody's disrespectful, when you find that sometimes it's just an emotional roller coaster that you go through in an everyday life scenario, when somebody hurts you, when somebody says something that really puts you in a place where you're embarrassed, what are we going to choose then? How are we going to practice self-control in those areas? Is it easy? No. By all means, it is not easy. When I'm angry, and somebody asks me to calm down, on the contrary, instead of calming down, I become even angrier. <laughs> so how is that easy? It is not easy. But that's where the ball is always back to my court. 
What do I want to choose with my emotions? How do I want to deal with all these emotions there? Do I let my emotions just go running wild? Or do I actually practice self-control with it? The next word that really comes to mind in terms of self-control is moderation. Moderation in what areas? In everything. You know, too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. Too much eating of a good food, you put on weight, and that doesn't benefit either. And when we talk about lifestyle, when we talk about health, when we talk about career, when we talk about work, when we talk about discipline, everything that we choose, we have to practice self-control. Even if we like hanging out with people, even if we like socializing, even if we like, even if we love our kids, there must be some form of moderation to balance out our lifestyle. That is why we have to practice self-control. Whatever it is that we are doing, we should not pursue it to a certain extent where we just pay disregard to everything else. Because this is what, when we go and read the books of Proverbs, now choices is really, we reflect or based on it a lot from the book of Proverbs. Because Proverbs is also known as a book of wisdom. That is why it's important for us to really, in, to really evaluate our own hearts, our desires there. What is it that God has placed in for us? And how do we actually practice self-control on a daily basis in respect to our life, our spiritual life, in regards to our family life, our career, all of this are interlinked. That is why it's important to really understand what does God want from us too. Words. Now a lot of every day I probably regretted saying something that I should not have said. This is especially true when you have got family around you, when you have got close people around you, and I'm pretty sure it's especially true when you have kids in your lives too. Because to hold our thumb, to hold our thumb, it is something that's so difficult sometimes. The words are just right at the tip of our mouth, and what are we gonna do? Are we gonna say it, or are we just gonna like, God, please help me right now. Just hold my mouth, keep it quiet. So how are we gonna do that? It is so, so tough. It is so, so difficult. And that is why we must have a disciplined mind, mindset to really allow the Holy Spirit to speak into each and every one of us, to then have our heart to submit to God so that this allows us to practice what God has given us a choice, a lifestyle that we are able to manage ourselves, to be able to put in place that God, you are in control. It is because that I want to be doing your will and not just my own will, I am able then to practice self-control. So we, we interface with a lot of decisions every day in our everyday lives on that we need that we should be choosing self-control. Instead of doing just what I want, I should choose to do what God wants. That's ultimately what it is. Do you want to do what you want to do? Or do you want to do what God wants to do? Man, most of the time I want to do what I want to do, not what God wants to do. I'm just only human. But how does this process start? How do we actually go about this? We do it one step at a time. Every day, every morning. Psalms 23 verse 4 says that even though I walk through the valley of death, I will feel no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. So it is through everyday process, taking one step at a time, that I then submit to God. I was like, God, okay, this is tough. You know how Psalms, Psalms is always quite a melodic uh, uh, Bible, uh, book, sorry. Even though if I walk through the valley of death, even though if I walk through the most difficult situation that I'm in, in the most difficult circumstances that I'm in, God, I choose to do your will, not my will. Because you will be able to guide me, you will be able to lead me. That is where I find my comfort in. That's what Psalms 23, 4 is saying. So we do it one step at a time. And every morning when we wake up, we do it also through the renewal of our minds there. Romans 12, verse 2, Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is whereby it is so important. Because... If our minds are not renewed, 
we won't be able to do God's will. Because we can't see it. If you tell a kid, if you go from point A to point B, just follow the straight line, just trust what I say, and just walk and you, re and you reach point B. For a child it's simple. They will say, okay, I'll walk. But if you tell that to an adult, walk from point A to point B, although you can't see point B yet, but if you keep walking straight, you will reach point B. As an adult, or if you tell me that, I'll be asking you a lot of questions. <laughs> really? Do I just walk straight? Is it just that easy? Do you actually know where point B is? So my point B may be different than your point B. And what happens if I hit the day then? Or what happens if this? I have to turn to the left or to the right? What happens if I get distracted? What happens if I want to stop? So an adult always comes back with you with a lot of other questions. We don't trust that easily because we don't see it. But when we are able to see it, when God renews our mind, that is why it's so important to be in the presence of God, to be in the fellowship of God's uh, with God's people like where you are today. Because this is whereby God will open up your eyes and you'll be able to see. And when God renews your mind, you will then also be able to have a different perspective that yes, I can do God's will because God only wants what's best for me. And I can trust Him on that account. But it is not easy. I struggle a lot of times with wondering, God, do you really know what's best for me? In your context, in what you say, having self-control doesn't mean that I do what I want that I think is best. But instead, I submit it to you. But when God renewed my mind, I was then able to see, and I was able to then trust Him a bit more, to understand that, God, you're right. It is true. I can trust you in this aspect. And I want to do your will in this aspect of my life. Because I can say that I don't trust God in all aspects of my life. But it is a process. When God continues, or rather when I continue to choose to allow God to work in me, to continue to renew my mind, each and every day, I can see that I'm progressing an inch at a time. And sometimes it's probably smaller than an inch. But I can see that's where God's grace comes in. He comes together with me. He comes together with your partners with you. And holds your hand and walk together with you to have this continuous transformation process of the renewal of the mind. And most of all, what is important that will allow us to choose self-control, to do God's will is that then we submit ourselves to God. James 4, 7, it says that submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Amen. Every day, the devil is trying to deceive us. And it comes in all sorts of forms, all sorts of ways. Sometimes we don't see it. It can be a distraction from our quiet time with God. It can be our dreams that we want to be pursuing, that we are so focused on it, that we just forget about everything else. But when we learn to submit it to God, when we learn to put it down by the altar, God will perfect it, everything into our lives. That's why earlier on when we sang the songs, it was, so, it was so important. All the dreams, all the plans that I have, God, I lay down at your altar. I choose to submit it to you. I choose to then practice self-control in your context, not in my context. I relegate down my will. The song that we sang, I give myself away, it's something that we need to be singing every morning. It is something that we need to tell God each morning when I wake up, God, this is what I choose. I choose to submit to your will today, so show me. Speak to me, speak to my heart and allow me to walk in towards the direction that you have for me. You see, lawlessness doesn't just mean that when you steal, you kill. The Bible is not talking just about that. It's talking about a lifestyle. A lifestyle that we have to continuously choose each day. Each and every day when we wake up. That I don't want to continue to be living in just my own lifestyle, Father. I want to choose to live according to your word. To your lifestyle. And this is how we're going to be able to do it. One step at a time by continuing asking God to renew our minds 
and by continuously submitting our will, our desire to God, it's a continuous process. It's not just like, God, I pray this, I'm good for the day or I'm good for the week. <laughs> it doesn't happen this way. It's going to be every moment sometimes that we face with so many situations that calls to us, that distracts us, that pulls our attention. Where do we want to put our heart to? What are we going to be doing? The choices that we face each and every day to decide. God, it is very difficult not to retaliate to what my husband just said, but Father, I choose to practice self-control. I choose to not just do what I feel like doing. I choose to do what you want to say. Instead of retaliating in anger and in hatred, I choose to make a decision to say that, God, by your grace, I am able to say that I forgive you and I still love you. That doesn't happen all the time, by the way. We still have a lot of arguments. And it's the same thing wherever you are, even with your workplace there. If somebody hurts you, if somebody backstabs you, what are you going to be saying? What are you going to be doing? How do you feel? Are you going to harbor all that anger against you and think about the next opportunity? Wait until the next time. I'm going to get back at you. That feels good in a way, but at the same time, it is not what God wants for us. Because God knows that ultimately, this is not going to be benefiting us. The lifestyle that we choose, that we think, that is nice, that is good, what Hollywood portrays. We think that that is life. God is saying, no, that is not your life. Trust me. Come and spend time with me. Come into my presence. And that's where you will begin to see your lives being transformed, your lives being changed. That you will really discover freedom. Freedom not bound, not dictated by the world, but freedom that God has given to each and every one of us to experience. That is what choices is all about, and that is why we found that it's so pertinent to talk about this topic, because all of us are faced with choices each day. Each and every one of us has a choice, has a choice to make. And I'll leave you with this here. What God expects us to attempt, <coughs> He also enables us to achieve. See, God will never put us into a position where His grace is not sufficient. Amen. God will never bring us to a place and watch us stand up from above. Oh, she's drowning. Let me just see how far she can drown. No, God's not going to say that. God is ever already just there for us. And when He puts us into that situation, or when He extends His arm right to us, or when He carries us through situations there, it is for the benefit for our growth. Self-control comes with maturity. Because we then have to put our faith more in God. We have to increase our faith every day. We can be increasing our faith little bit by little bit. And all God needs is just faith as tiny as a mustard seed and He can move mountains. Hallelujah. When we come to God and when we put our, put our hearts and our troubles and our desires to Him, God help me to practice self-control. Enable me, Father, to choose self-control, to choose Your will. Not, my, not, not just my will, even though sometimes I do think I know better than You, God, but help me, God. Help me to make these choices. These are the prayers that we can be praying. God's not saying and sitting up there folding his arms and say that, ha, huh, you better choose what is right. You know, sometimes we tell kids this way, you better choose what is right. No, God's not saying that. God is saying, when God said, take my yoke, he's asking us, would you trust me to take this journey on together with me? All you have to do is just put your hand up. All you have to do is just pray the simple prayer. All you have to do is really to ask God to give you the strength to make that choice. And this is why the Bible says that He enables us. God knew that, man, I could not make a lot of decisions on my own. I, don't, I do not have that capacity. 
I do not have that strength. I do not have that energy, nor do I have that discipline. And this is why this quote is so resound, resonates so much, especially for this topic, choosing God's will, not my own. He is the one who enables us to reach to where He wants us to go. When Christ, when God sent Christ to die on the cross, that was the enabling factor. That was the bridge. That is why we can choose to partner with God. Because through the death of Christ, all of us are saved by grace. Nothing more, nothing less. No matter how far gone we think our lives has turned to, no matter where we are at, no matter how, how, many, how much sin you so-called that we have accumulated, no matter what our past tells us, no matter what we've done, no matter what our present circumstances tells us, no matter what everybody right now is telling us, nothing matters more than what God says. Nothing matters more than His grace that has enabled us to be where we are today. And as long as we choose to just take that step of faith, to trust God, He's going to enable us. But this doesn't mean we don't feel down. This doesn't mean we don't feel broken. This does not mean that we do not feel weak. This does not mean that we don't feel tempted. It means all of those. But at the same time, it also means this. We can have hope because God has given us hope. It also means that God is always going to be there to pick us up when we fall. It also means that whenever we come back to God again and say that, God, I'm sorry, I messed up. I really, really messed up this time. God's not going to turn His back on you and say that you deserve it. God's going to say that, come home, my child. Come to my arms. And not just like that prodigal son with the father. What did the father do after all this time when the, when the son spent all his money, screwed his whole, whole life around? Did the father say anything when he saw his son? His son was filthy. His son was full of brokenness, remorse. And all the father did was he just opened up his arms, ran out to him. He must have smelled pretty bad, by the way. But he didn't care. He just grabbed him to his arms and hugged him and loved him and kissed him. And this is what the father is also saying to each and every one of us here today. No matter how much you've messed up, all God is focusing it is just seeing you again and He runs to you. He pursues us. And because of that, we can then have a little bit of faith, a little bit of confidence to know that, God, let me give this a try. I've got nothing more. I've got nothing else to lose anymore. My entire life I've lived in, according to my own will. But God, let me give this a try in this area of my life, in the other areas of my life. Let me just trust you. And God's just right there, ready to help us, ready to lift us up. So let me just close in prayer there. Father, thank you for the cross. Because it is a cross that has made everything possible, that through grace we are all saved. That is because of the love that you have for each and every one of us. That I can stand up here today to know that God, I'm not talking because I'm better than anyone else, but it's because God, you have enabled me. Through the experiences that I've been through, Father, you are the one who has turned things around to be able to bring glory to your name. And I ask that Holy Spirit, you speak to each and every one of us here. Give us that gentle nudge that sometimes all of us need to go into your presence, to say that, Father, help me. Help me to choose to do your will and not mine. Help me to submit myself to you. That you will lead and guide us in each and every time, in each and every moment. Give us the strength, Father. 
Amen. Is that a good word? We have a couple minutes, and I was just reflecting. Usually, when we think about self-control, we we think about maybe the the physical aspects of that. Uh, maybe we think about the emotional aspects of that. But have you considered the spiritual aspects of self-control and lawlessness? What do you think spiritual law lawlessness looks like for a Christian? A mess. A mess. <laughs> Unbelief. Good answer. No faith. I'm going to do everything in my strength and I'm not going to go any further than that. Good answer. I'm sorry? Finished? Dead. Dead. Thinking about the spiritual things. Disorder about the thinking of those things. Disorder about thinking about spiritual things. Yeah, I think the world in general is spiritually lawless because they're out there playing God. They want life on their terms. As believers, we've come to the point we said, okay, I give up on playing God. And I give up trying to live a life that's good enough that's going to earn me a place in heaven. And I surrender and accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. Maybe there's someone here today who never came to that place, and I want you to think about that. Are you good enough in your own strength? Or do you need to surrender to the Savior? But as we come to Christ, uh, He doesn't want just a part of us. He wants... All of us, doesn't he? He wants surrender. And one of the ways that I see believers uh, avoid surrendering is they want to be a Christian, but not a disciple. You know what the difference is? They want to be a Christian, but not a disciple. And Jesus died. And the last thing he said is go and make what? Disciples. Disciples. Okay? A great way to stay a Christian and avoid being a disciple is to be a spectator and come and visit church, come and consume, but never give anything. Never make a commitment. Never join a local church. Never do any of that stuff. Just come in under the radar and go out under the radar and no one asks anything of you and you're welcome to do that but you won't grow as a disciple of Jesus Christ until you put down roots in a local community of faith so I want to encourage you if that's you we have new connections and we want to help you get plugged in to this church family we want to help you grow as a believer um, one other thing I thought of in your great message. Um, obviously, we need the Lord's help for this. But one time I knew the answer to this. Uh, anybody, maybe someone does. You know how many times the Bible says one another? More than I can count. More than I can count. A lot. And yes, we need the Lord. But yes, we need one another as well. You think about the power of uh, small groups, like um, recovery groups. They, we, we're built that way that we need the encouragement of one another in our lives. And we need the vulnerability where we can say, you know, I'm struggling with my weight. Uh, I need people to encourage me in this area. Not to shame me in this area and guilt me in this area, but people to encourage me. And we all need that kind of encouragement. And if you have nothing else to give, you can always give encouragement in the body of Christ. We, we will never get enough encouragement. You're not going to come and go, oh, I guess nobody needs encouragement here. I promise you, 
every single Sunday, every single home group that you go to, you'll be able to find someone who can appreciate encouragement. So I want to ask you to stand. My benediction is going to be out of Hebrews 10, 25. Yeah, ministry team, you guys can start coming forward if you want. It says, let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. So, Father, we thank you for your life in us, your spirit in us that gives us power. But I pray, Lord, also that would you would use uh, your spirit within us to encourage other people. And I just want to speak a blessing over everyone here today. Uh, I want to bless you with encouragement that you were loved by the one who matters most. May you go from here with a revelation of the love of God. And I want you to go from here with a revelation that Jesus Christ has given you grace. That you can rest in His finished works. And I bless you to go from here with a revelation that you have the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. That you don't leave this place alone. Uh, this week, even if you don't meet another Christian, you are not alone. God is always with us, and He is with you. So I bless you today to go in faith and self-control in Jesus' name.